Hi, this is Wayne Zell, and welcome to Blueprint for Wealth, your fast-paced video cast that's designed to help you realize your personal dreams of wealth and freedom. And we always feature special guests, and my very special guest today is Tina Fox. Welcome, Tina. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Wayne. I'm super excited to be here with you today. Well, it's, it's excellent to have you here with us. And uh, before we get into all the details of you know, how Tina became and has succeeded as an entrepreneur, I'll give you a little bit of her background. She's uh, an experienced and award-winning from the ground up corporate executive. And we'll talk about that a little bit to see how she became after that an entrepreneur specializing in biz dev, business development, and bringing excellence to all the spaces that she's worked in. Um, I, I'm going to ask about your sixth grade adventures as to how you won your first sales contest and what it was about. But she now is involved in creating groups and mentoring groups. Uh, she merged with Women on Course. Uh, she supports the professional development of women in entrepreneurship. And she has a mentoring uh, company called TURN, T-E-R-N, which is a B corporation. We've done uh, educational moments on that. And we'll ask you a little bit about that. And then she's also on the executive advisory board in the College of Business School of Management at uh, her alma mater, which is James Madison University, one of the best basketball and football programs in the country, and is a keynote speaker. And uh, so she's got a family. She's got kids. She's got a bonus. She's a bonus mom. She even has a Portuguese water dog, which uh, I love those dogs, by the way. They're, they're so very cool. So first of all, Sixth grade? How did you win a sales contest in sixth grade? You know, they they, they loop you in early and often, uh, Wayne. So in sixth grade, we had the uh, holiday wrapping paper and candle contest. And so ah. there was a very magnanimous guy who came on stage with a boom mic and he was he had a table full of prizes and he said, hey, whoever sells the most can win this grand prize. And it was this beautiful teddy bear. And so I looked at that and my eyes went wide open and I thought, I'm winning that teddy bear. And so I asked my mom if I could go to her place of business and sell wrapping paper and candles. And, you know, my first sales experience was probably not the best because everybody said yes. And I sold the most and I won that teddy bear and I was sold on sales. But then when I got into the real world and had to do cold calling, I realized that's not always the case. Being young and selling wrapping paper and candles around the holidays, probably a good recipe, but, you know, cold calling, not necessarily the easiest route. So, you know, you went from sixth grade, you got all the way through school, you got through high school, you got through college. And uh, how did you get into sales originally? What did you do to transition into the world of sales? Yeah, so really that sixth grade experience was so profound that when I was in high school and I was doing odd jobs, you know, in the summer and on holidays, weekends, I ended up choosing a sales job at a company called Best Products. It's no longer around, but they had several different departments and one was jewelry and this girl likes her jewelry. So I started off in jewelry sales. You started in watches and if you did a good job with that, you moved to silver and then gold and semi-precious and then finally the commission dollars of diamonds. So I, I had the bug early. And then so I, you want to hear something funny? What's so that? my first one of my first jobs was working for my dad who ran the jewelry departments for a company called Medco. And they used to run all the jewelry concessions in GEM, GEX, uh, Woolco, all around the country. And then he had his own jewelry store. So you and I love jewelry. I mean, I oh love my jewelry. God. My wife loves jewelry. As a result, so. well, she's lucky she married you because at least you have the understanding. And when you have the understanding, it's easier to part with your money when it comes to that. Yeah, you know, it's it's a it is a tough thing to interest people in buying it because being on the other side, be, being a salesperson in jewelry, I worked in my dad's store for many years, uh, all the way through college and afterwards, and it was uh, it was a great educational experience. You really learn how to appeal to different types of people. And um, you have to have a certain kind of personality, which it appears that you have. And so what did you do in, uh, you were in medical devices, as I understand it? Yeah, so when I went to college, which my, I told my parents I wanted to go into sales, and my mother said, why do you need to go to college? You can just go right into sales from high school. But I said, because I think I wanna get into management and leadership, so I'm gonna need at a minimum a four-year degree. So that's how I ended up in college. Okay. Um, and I studied communications, 
And post-college, you know, when they do the career fairs, there are lots of different companies. And I happened to identify with a company um, in the healthcare market. They were focused on building their first vertical in healthcare. So they were doing forms and labels and things of that nature for hospital systems and doctor's offices. And that's how I got my entree into healthcare sales. And I wasn't there long, probably for about a year and a half before I started meeting folks that were also showing up in the same places as I, but they were selling far sexier widgets uh, than I was selling. And they were having true effect on patient care, which became a huge interest of mine. And I ended up talking to some of these folks and started going out and doing my own research. And I identified through a mentor of mine, an interstitial therapist uh, by the name of Barb Ostertag, I'll never forget her, at Bethesda Naval Hospital. She, she said, you know, I think you got real promise and uh, you got to figure out what you want to do in med tech. And at the time I was very young and I said, well, what's really hot? You know, you're, you're in medicine. And she said two areas, cardiology and orthopedics. And she ended up setting me up in rotations with each one of those. So had it not been for that mentor, I, I may not have been on the path that I ended up on, but I did rotations in both. Orthopedics, um, although I don't have any problems with the, you know, uh, the saws and the blood and the gut and all that stuff, I, I really didn't care for the sound of, of what I was hearing. And so that sort of came off the list. And when I went into cardiology, I saw the magic of balloon angioplasty and how we were able to get heart attack patients through the cath lab in short order and back to living their normal lives. That was innovation. That was yeah. where I wanted to be. And that's where I ended up for the majority of my career. You know, having been through a lot of orthopedic and cardiology uh, procedures, endovascular, et cetera, I can attest to the, the miracles of science and medicine that, you know, you were helping uh, people uh, experience. And so you did that for a long, long time. You were in medical sales for many, many years, almost 22 years. Is that about right? Yeah, time flies when you're having fun. I, you know, the majority of that was um, in Fortune 500 companies like Johnson and Johnson, and then Covidian. I moved from cardiac to neuro because neuro was becoming the new burgeoning space. Um, and about six and a half years of that was in med tech startups, of which two of those were successful exits. So I had some exposure to what it was like to being on teams that had to build out small companies in these mega spaces. Um, that was uh, after my Fortune 500 time. So I get the connection now. I see how you were able to evolve into entrepreneurship because you were working with startup companies. Yes, yes. Is, and I is really, that what got you into it? Well, I, not really. I, I hate to, I, I'd love to make that connection like so succinct. But no, I, I did learn something, though. The value of the large corporations was that I got to see many departments. I got excellent training. I ended up building out training nationally and internationally for device teams. Um, I, you know, I got lots of management and leadership experience and, and that was wonderful. And then later on in that 22 years, I was able to apply all of that in the startup space. And I started really enjoying that because I had the opportunity to challenge myself with multiple hats. And so I could get out of straight up business development and into things like marketing, you know, working with clinical, key opinion leader development, strategic management, things of that nature. And that was fascinating. I, I loved it. But it wasn't because of that that I became an entrepreneur. I, I came I became an accidental entrepreneur. And how did how did you stumble into it? Yeah. So. Really, um, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of invention, as they like to say. And that was certainly my case. So I, I became an uh, older mom. So I found myself in the position of having two wonderful boys who at the time I was about 90 percent travel nationally. Oh. And that does not uh, that does not encourage present parenthood. And so, you know, I had lots of conversations with um, my spouse, my husband and we decided together that in order to uh, make it right for our family and do what we believed in, we were going to burn the boats. And we did. My husband is a uh, attorney in real estate. I'm a business development specialist. So we took our talents and skills. We left both of our, you know, corporate jobs, our, our big title jobs, and we decided to start our own business, Cobalt Settlements, which is an alive, alive and well to today. It's, it's 10 years old this year. Well, tell me about Cobalt. What do they do? So Cobalt is a title, title and settlement company. We do residential commercial real estate settlements for the DMV, the, the district, uh, Maryland and Virginia. 
and we'll we'll do it for you know anybody that's looking to buy or sell in commercial or residential. Good to know. I have a lot of referrals for you. Awesome. When, <laughs> and and at, right around the same time when you were involved with Cobalt, um, you started out with a company called Women in on Course. Tell us about that. Yeah. So, uh, you know what? I got to give a lot of credit to my husband um, because when we started Cobalt, he actually said, I think it would be wise of you to create your own umbrella company. And I said, why is that? And he said, we're going to leverage your business development talents in real estate. However, I don't see that being your Ballywick long term. I think that there are going to be projects and opportunities that pop up that won't make sense underneath the title and settlement umbrella. But if you have your own umbrella company, you can seek out those projects and, and connect in those projects the way you want. So okay. one of the things that happened is I created a, a small group of women because I went from a male dominated med tech world to a very female dominated uh, real estate world. And so I thought there was some opportunities for me to support the women in sales in how to better sales. So I started this small women in business group. We started with eight women over a lunch and over three years, we turned it into 1300 women. They, they really wanted to get connected. This wow. was by accident. It was not planned to go that way. And I was still in the build out of Cobalt. So I met a wonderful woman by the name of Donna Hoffman and she really liked what I was doing with women in business. I needed to do something with the women that I had now grown to 1300. And so it was very logical to move them into women on course corporate ventures. So Donna and I went into a partnership and we built out women on course corporate ventures, which is really a, a membership organization of about 60,000 women nationally. And we support these women in personal and professional development on the course, meaning on the golf course. What a fun role that was. So we, we leverage golf as a way for uh, networking. And we know a lot of businesses are, you know, is done on the course. And sometimes women are left out of that conversation. Yeah. So we yeah. make sure that they're not left out. Are you a good golfer? I'm a terrible golfer. My handicap is probably akin to what most people score on the front nine. But <laughs> I, I, tell, I tell everybody I play with, I know two very important things. I know pace of play and I know etiquette. And I don't get too wrapped around the axle about my own game. So we all have a good time. You know, I'm not, I'm a terrible golfer too. And that's what stopped me from golfing with other men. <laughs> I also am a very emotional person and I tend to express my emotions. Well, so, we um, at women on course. So come on, just because our title is women on course, we love the guys. You come on out and you play with us and we'll have a good time. I'll, I'll drive the cart. How's that? I'll drive the beer cart. Even better. Even okay. better. That's, that's what I'm good for. Um, Fox paradigm was an outgrowth. It looks like of some of the stuff you had been doing. And you're basically a connector, a facilitator, a podcaster, like, like, like me, but, and you, and you do speaking. Tell me what the focus of Fox Paradigm is today. Fox Paradigm is exactly what I described that my husband was encouraging me to do, which is that umbrella organization to really seek out the things that I had passions for. And so I was able to support the build out of Cobalt. I was able to support the build out of Women on Course. I do a lot of my speaking underneath the Fox Paradigm umbrella. And then in my give back to my alma mater, James Madison University, I chair one of the boards at the university and I found myself mentoring many students. And it was in that connection that I truly found my ultimate passion. And if I didn't know what it was that everything in my life was leading up to, the culmination resulted in turn mentoring. So turn mentoring started under Fox Paradigm as a project. And then it quickly built out. And this is, this is really the, the next venture of where I see myself in the next many years. And Turn Mentoring is now its own standalone company outside of Fox Paradigm, but it's where I spend the most amount of my time. Do you have employees, independent contractors that work with you in these businesses? So not yet. It is me only. However, I do hire, um, you know, software developers because I'm, I'm a communications major. I'm not a coder. Um, and we did develop a web application, so I needed to hire out for that. Um, but the brainchild of the of the program and of where I want to see it go um, stemmed from my involvement at JMU. And since then, I've been adding folks on uh, through sweat equity um, into into the organization. So I've got some some individuals who volunteer their time because they believe in the mission and they really want to see this succeed. And this year is um, going out for seed funding. So this summer is going to be very busy. 
So it's interesting. Um, you know, as, as you know, I, I've written a book on exit planning and my focus, my practice heavily is on business exit planning. What's your exit plan? Yeah. So it's interesting. This space of mentorship and tech kind of came into being in the United States in about 2016. So we're less than 10 years old, all of us. And so if you look at where turn mentoring is and where some of the competitors in this space are, I see in the next five to 10 years, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, not sure if we're going to be the one that's acquiring or we're the, going to be the one that's merging, but there right. is an opportunity down the line for that. And eventually I see an opportunity for sale. So um, we'll see. That's that's the goal in the next 10 years is to build out something that is wonderful, creates a lot of connections, um, but they can be taken to the next level through maybe an M&A opportunity. Is is mentoring the, uh, you know, I, I'm, I mentor a lot of young people, too. I teach at George Mason University, yeah. and and I, I, I really believe in that, and I mentor my staff. But would you equate mentoring to coaching? Is there an accountability component to that? How, do, how would you define mentoring today? Yeah, mentoring, you can call it a lot of different things. You can call it coaching, you know, somebody being your guide, uh, supporter, cheerleader. For me, mentorship is really a way for somebody who has gone before to live their legacy. You can live your legacy through passing on your wisdom. And the name of the company, actually, Wayne, is TURN, as you mentioned earlier, T-E-R-N. And you might be able to see that bird over my shoulder there. So that, that is, that is the Arctic turn. And the Arctic turn is known as the animal on earth with the longest migratory path. And what it does is it goes from pole to pole in no sequential order. It sort of meanders, but it always comes back home. And that to me is a mentor's journey is that you start with this common place. Perhaps it's your university, college. You go out, you gain life experience, wisdom, career experience, and then you come back to serve those who are coming in behind you. That's the, that's the way that I see mentorship. How do you grow that into a business that can be sold? With TURN, it's really about organizing um, and herding cats and creating something that is scalable, simple, and effective. And so mentorship has been around you know, since the beginning of time. But right. entering into the concept of mentorship can be difficult, whether it's, you know, who do I ask? How do I know I'm going to be well matched with this person? What kinds of conversations do we carry on? How long do we do this for? And then how do we exit? And those types of things can be very daunting for individuals. And with our insistence on tech um, and then COVID ending up, you know, keeping us apart as far as interpersonal connection, it's gotten more complicated for the younger populations than ever before. So with turn mentoring, it's really providing that structure and support as a guide to introducing two individuals for a finite period of time. It's always time bound in a way that's comfortable for those individuals, well thought out. And by the time they exit, both parties feel extraordinarily valued. Many of them carry on conversations thereafter. Mm -hmm. But we are, you know, our vision is to be what Airbnb is for homeowners and vacation renters, or Uber is for drivers and riders, and Amazon is for products and buyers. We are the connection between mentors and mentees. So if everybody has a place in which this gets done well, we're the place in which it gets done well. So you're building, you've built or building a platform for other mentors to utilize, connect with potential mentees and give them processes, uh, technology, uh, account, uh, accountability, uh, accounting, billing, all that, all that in one place. It sounds like a franchise to me. Well, we're not looking to sell this to the mentor and mentee. Our target audience, as far as paying customer, is the universities. So these, ah. these universities, you know, they are working very hard to differentiate themselves from each other. And they also know that there is a lot more options for people to um, get higher education outside of a two year, four year institution. So they want the, they're, they're expecting better programming for their students. And they've always wanted the opportunity to connect with their alumni through effective engagement. And how do you do that when the alumni are scattered to the four corners of the earth and maybe don't have the time to come back? You know, universities are always asking for the three T's, as I like to call it. They're, they're looking for time, talent, and treasure. You working for George Mason, you know, and, and mentoring there, you, you know that very well. So many mentors, they, they don't necessarily have the level of treasure 
that may be desired by the university, but they certainly have the time and talent. And so accessing them exactly where they are in order to deliver that and for them to feel valued is what we serve at turn. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a graduate of the McIntyre School at UVA, and, and I serve on the Cornerstone Board down there, which is the treasure component of the uh, of the university. Um, but I, I agree. I think there's not enough focus that's placed in curriculum uh, that focuses on this type of thing. I mean, there's management courses and there's, you know, uh, other types of uh, courses that where, you know, people are getting into industrial psychology and organizational behavior. But when it really comes down to it, having somebody who's been there and done that like you is an invaluable resource. And then building a network of those people for all across the country in any university, it really doesn't matter where it is, I think is a really valuable thing to do. And I, it, you. it's you're giving back something that uh, very few people can do. Well, selfishly speaking, it's, um, it's really a way to serve my younger self. When I was coming out of college, I was first generation. And so I was tapped out with my parents as far as what they could advise me on moving forward. And here I was trying to move into private sector and showcase how this is done for my siblings and my cousins. And uh, I, I really needed a mentor at the time. I never want anybody to feel that way. So offering them this through the program, through their university, gives them a leg up, just gives them that additional person or professional to support them in that path. You know, it's funny. I, I, I also, I went to William and Mary for law school and, and I'm on the, uh, I get tapped every year to mentor a first year that's coming in, you know, and I, so I always do that. It's something that I get a lot of enjoyment out of. The, I, they don't have a process and they don't have a, you know, systems that facilitate it other than here's the person's resume. Here's what, you know, they're looking for. Give them a call and talk to them. And I think it would be helpful for other mentors, including myself, to have uh, more of a programmed approach to mentoring. And it sounds like it's something that you have developed. I, I love hearing that from you. I love hearing that from you because you're connected to so many different universities and you yeah. stay connected and you really know. So thank you for being a mentor at William & Mary. I think that that's wonderful. But you're absolutely right. We are the first mentor-focused digital platform for universities, their students, alumni, and then also for companies and, and how they want to engage, not only with the students, but even amongst themselves. Um, and yeah, you're absolutely right. Like I said, mentorship is hard to scale if you don't have the right process. And I've being a product of um, my parents, my mother's Chinese, my father's a military um, military um, colonel, U.S. Army, and we moved all the time. And my mom, being being Asian, you know, she always had a little bit of trouble with the language, and so we had to assimilate very quickly. And one of the things that I remember is that you know, always trying to make people feel comfortable um, when they're trying to assimilate or mm -hmm. trying to learn something new. And so I, I saw my mom go through some of that and she's just got such a um, optimistic personality that she kind of managed her way through a lot of that. But not everybody is an extrovert. Not everybody is super optimistic and they need some guide and support to identify the right partner for them and then to support them through those conversations. And so that's, that's how we build this out in order to make it very comfortable for everybody involved. What challenges are you facing in launching and growing TURN and uh, also the other projects that you're involved in? You know, um, I was talking about this earlier to somebody. Uh, I, I was talking to a mentor of mine. So I went to go seek a super mentor today in Arlington. And um, this gentleman is, has raised well over $100 million on his own. So, so he knows how to do capital raises. Wow. And, and I was picking his brain and I said, you know, I spent 22 years in cardiac and neuro and I, I can speak the language of, of those things. But then when I came in as an entrepreneur and again, I'm an accidental entrepreneur, entrepreneurship has its own language, you know, uh, cap tables and valuations and pre-money and post-money and safe and convertible notes. And, <laughs> and it just blew my mind. And I was like, golly, I'm a comm major. I didn't have entrepreneurship as an opportunity in college. And so it's like learning all over again. And, you know, I will for forever, now that I'm in this space, anybody who's an entrepreneur that asks me, I will never use acronyms without describing what that acronym is. 
And I will never assume that they understand all the language that goes along with this kind of business. So it's, it, you know, it's kind of funny at some times, but it's kind of frustrating at other times when you're trying to keep up with the conversations of people that have gone before you. Um, that's been a little difficult, but nothing that you can't overcome. And thank God for Google is all I have to say. That's very <laughs> it's gotten even better with, with AI and it's going to, yeah. although it's a little, you know, as an attorney, I, I'll use it. I'll go on and use chat GPT or Google AI and, and, uh, you know, it's interesting to see some of the answers you get to some of the questions you put up there. So you got to be as as one who's a technical person, you got to be really careful about what you say at, based on what you're researching using AI. But uh, oh, it is it's you amazing. Know, you, you have a, you have a really great point, Wayne. And so when you look up things on the Internet and I said to the super mentor today, I said, how do you know, like whether you should look at, you know, um, an angel or if you should go for a family office or VC and all this stuff. And I said, you, you can look things up on the Internet, but you get way too much information. And so that's where mentorship and having that interpersonal connection with people that you know, like and trust, that's where you, it starts to coalesce. Then you can like kind of balloon test like this is what I heard. Is that really what's going on or what's been your experience? And so thank God for human beings. As, as great as AI and tech is, thank God for human beings. Is your platform designed to attract mentors or mentees? I mean, obviously you're going to go to the universities, you're going to go to the corporations, but how do you, you know, who are you targeting in terms of people that can get on the platform? Because one of the things I would worry about as one who's, you know, setting up this type of a platform, how do you get the real deal? How do you get the person who really is capable of being a mentor on your platform as opposed to somebody who says, you know, they have a lot of experience and then they may not and they may have alternative uh, goals and objectives that may not match up with your vision and your values. Yeah, this, this can be peeled out in a lot of different ways. Um, yeah. I, think, I think the path that I'll go down, which is the simplest path, is that, you know, if you, if you think back to when you were in college, OK, your 18 to 21 year old self and at 25, could you have offered your 21 year old self some pretty good wisdom? A little bit. But yeah. Not much. Well, you know, every every little bit that we gain, um, we're able to say, oh, like I look at who I was in college and I would have told my high school self, don't do that. We're signing <laughs> class, right? So we we all we all bring in all of these experiences, even in a short period of time. What, what we're really seeking and who we're trying to attract is we're trying to attract the person with the mentor's heart. The students are there. They, they are there. They want to do this. They want to get connected. They're shy to go on LinkedIn and, you know, just do a, a search on their own and start cold calling people. They, they want to be part of something that's structured. They won't necessarily do it on their own, but if they're put into something, they will accept it and they, they run with it really well. So now it's really about identifying those with a mentor's heart. And you know what? It's not for everybody. Not everybody is in it to win it for another person in that, in that capacity. And that's fine. In order yeah. for the platform to work well at a university, we're looking for about 2% of their graduating uh, alumni. And so, for instance, if you look at my university, James Madison, we have over 160,000 living alumni. We can capture about 2% of those. We're serving about 10% of the university and mentorship. So, you know, it's not a, a tremendous amount of individuals and of 160,000, you would think you can get 2,500 individuals that, you know, are like, hey, I wanna serve the university. I've got something that I'd like to say to support a student and I will help them get networked with my network. And it all starts with that. And then we go from there and we add in. So you're, uh, it seems like you're building algorithms or some type of, uh match.com analogy that puts together mentees and mentors. Is yeah, right? we do have a pretty sophisticated matching algorithm right now, even without AI, I'd like to say, um, we have a 99% success rate with, wow. with our matches. So we do extraordinarily well. Um, I got a, whenever I get these emails, it, it almost makes me um, tear up a little bit. I got an email today from a mentor you know, just saying uh, cheers to you and your team. I've never felt so valued in such a simple program. And and that that makes everything that I do so worthwhile. But yeah, we have an algorithm that does a really great job. I, I specifically was seeking 
one that I could work with the coders on that is what I call non-identical matching. And by that, I mean, you know, here I was a female in a male dominated med tech world. And I learned a lot from my male counterparts, old, young, um, you know, different nationalities. And, and I find true value in that. And, you know, going back to the fact that I'm, I'm half Asian, I, I find a lot of value in identifying with lots of different cultures. I find it fascinating. So in building out our algorithm, we were looking at, you know, not necessarily male for male, female for female, white for white, black for black. We were looking for enough commonalities to create a conversation of comfort. But then we wanted people to extend themselves a little bit to have to learn more about another person. And that is where the real work begins. And that's where the fascination, the curiosities um, that that's where we impact the most. So I'm very proud of, of being able to have built that with the coders and uh, having the kind of numbers that we do today. So who would you like to contact you to find out more about TURN and how do they do that? Oh my gosh, they can go to turnmentoring.com. Um, we've got uh, areas there where they can plug in their name, phone number, et cetera. They can be put into a holding pool, identify what university they're with. Um, we also have an info at turnmentoring.com email. They can email us directly and let us know, hey, I'm interested in being a mentor. doesn't matter what university. Uh, or, hey, I'm interested in partnering with Turn Mentoring because I, I am at a university. Um, we're very excited to work with our university partners because, like you said, mentorship exists, but it may not exist well. So let us introduce you to how it can be done very well. And we would love to work with you on that. Well, we want to thank you, Tina, for being a guest on Blueprint for Wealth. Thank you you so are making much. tremendous inroads, not only in helping women, but also helping students uh, transition into their lives. And uh, thank you. I mean, it's a, from the bottom of my heart. If you, uh, if you need a mentor, I'm always willing to men mentor anybody. So just well, tell, me, tell me how to sign up. I'm in. Yeah. And you've got alphabet soup after your name, Wayne, with the JD, CPA, and lots of different things. So um, we'll be we'll be doing some some work together as well in that space because I know that you really want to mentor and support entrepreneurs, and I yes. can't thank you enough for doing that. Um, there you. are very few people that are interested in that space because it's more volatile, it's smaller, it's less well known. But for those like you who are like, hey. I love the entrepreneur. I, I love your spirit and I want to help support you to the next level. Um, we'll be doing some business together. So I want I'm to looking you. forward to it. Thank you. For that. All right. Well, thank you, Tina. And thanks for, for watching and listening to Blueprint for Wealth. Another exciting episode with a very special guest. Tune in next time for another special guest that hopefully blows your socks off. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.